In our series entitled Journey Life, Lessons from Old Testament People of Faith, we've been looking at the book of Ruth for the last, this is the third lesson in this series, and we still have two more to go. But I have just absolutely loved this study on the book of Ruth. I call it the hallmark channel of the Old Testament. Uh, In so many ways, it is the taking of the book of Job and combining that with the book of Song of Solomon. It's, It's a a story of tragedy, and then it's a story of triumph, and it's just absolutely beautifully written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we're in chapter 2. We're in chapter 2 today. Now, you have to go back to chapter 1 to be set up, okay, to, to see what is going on in the text. Uh, Ruth chapter 1 ends with, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women explained, can this be Naomi? Now, Naomi and her husband, Elimelech, along with their two sons, had left ten years earlier. All right? And they'd gone to the land of Moab because of famine in the land, very likely due to Israel's first time they abandoned God after the generation of Joshua had had disappeared. And, And so they went to Moab to find food. And, of course, while they're there, tragedy struck. Elimelech dies. Ruth, Ruth, uh, excuse me, uh, Naomi is is able to arrange marriages for her two sons, one of which was to Ruth. Her two sons die. And, of course, she's left with her two daughter-in-laws, and she hears that things are better back in, in Israel, especially Bethlehem. And so she decides to go back, urges her daughter in law not to go with her. They're Moabites. They don't speak the language. They don't worship the same God. They don't understand the culture. But they love Naomi. And of course, one of the daughter-in-laws chooses to go back, but Ruth does it. And you have that beautiful scene in Ruth chapter 1 where Ruth you know, urges her, you know, don't, don't uh, make me go away because your people are going to be your, uh, my people and your God's going to be my God. And, and you have that beautiful quote there found in chapter 1. And and so they head back to Bethlehem, and when they arrive, the people are like, Naomi? Is this this Naomi? Now, the only time that happens to me is when I go back home and go out in the country. I mean, if I go out in the country, I'll I'll get that response. You know, somebody will say, okay, I don't don't know you. And, And I'll go, well, I'm... Les, Leslie Chapman, they know me as Leslie back in Mississippi. I'm Leslie Chapman. I remember going many, many years ago for a funeral down there, and I went to a general store where my dad's first cousin ran the store. And I walked in, and his name's Curtis, and I said, Hey, Curtis, how you doing? And he looked at me, and I could tell he didn't know who I was. And I said, You don't recognize me, do you? And he's like, No. And I said, Well, I'm, I'm Leslie Chapman. And then it kicked in. You H's, boy? Now, you got to understand, my dad went by his initials L-H, and then they shortened it down to just plain H. And so everybody knew my dad as H. And, and he's like, you H's, boy? And I said, yeah. I hadn't seen you in forever, you know. And the preacher who was with me, we walked out, and he says, wow, that was going back in time. I said, I know it. I mean, that's the way it is down here. That's what happened to Naomi. This is Naomi? Hadn't seen her in over a decade, and she sure didn't look like this when she left. And then she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara in Hebrew means bitter. And and then she explains why. And I want you to look at specifically verse 21. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And then look at the last line. The Lord has afflicted me, and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. If there's been a point in your life where you're just like, God, even you are against me. But that's where Naomi was in her life. And so her and Ruth head back to Bethlehem, and and the only hope you have in chapter 1 is in verse 22, they arrived in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. And, And there you get that little glimpse It's that little quick scene in a show or a movie that you're thinking, okay, that means something. 
That's pointing to something that's fixing to happen. And so chapter 2 begins with the introduction of Boaz. And, and it's important to see the role Boaz plays in this short little book. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech. In other words, came from the same family. I mean, used two families were huge. I don't, I don't know how big your family is. You know, June and I had two boys. I was one of four. My dad was one of eight. My grandmother was one of 11. You see, what happened is, you know, we've kind of come along the last several generations. They had clans. And, and so he was from the same clan as Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, it's very important that you make the link with Boaz to where we're first introduced to Boaz. And the way you know that link is from Matthew 1, 5. They would have known it very easily when the book was written. This of all people is Rahab's son. Rahab the harlot. Rahab the woman who hid the spies. Rahab the, Rahab the woman from Jericho. The one who hid the spies up on top of her house, you know, and made them pledge that when they finally destroyed the city, they would spare her and her parents and her brothers and sisters, which of course they did. And Rahab had married a man by the name of Salmon, and they had had a son named Boaz. Now, it's important that you remember that because that leads us to our first lesson today, and that is personal experience affect how we look at specific situations. We all know this. I mean, if you've gone through something, whatever it is, and then you meet someone who's going through it, you're able to relate to that person. I mean, if you've been through divorce, you have a heart for people who are going through divorce. If you've lost a child, you have a heart for people who, who just lost a child. You know, if, if you've had cancer, you relate to people who are battling cancer. Or as in my case, if you've had heart bypass surgery. I mean, you can instantly relate to people who are fixing to have you know, heart bypass surgery. Our personal experiences affect how we look at specific situations. Boaz's mother was a Canaanite. She was someone who didn't grow up as a believer in God of Israel. But she had heard enough and she had processed enough. By the time the spies got there, she knew that the God of Israel was the one true God of heaven and earth. And Boaz had heard that story over and over and over, which is why he hears about a Moabite who's come back with an Israelite to Bethlehem, he immediately takes notice of it. You have to notice that. And by the way, that's always important because our personal experience is what gives us inroads into other people's lives. And so verse 2 begins with that very language. And Ruth, the Moabite, notice that emphasizing that. Why? Because Boab is the son of a Canaanite. So Ruth said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the left over grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. Now, it's fascinating in the commentaries. They want to know why didn't Naomi go. And I suspect there's several reasons. Number one, she's just come back home to a house that's not been lived in evidently for over 10 years. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed what happens to houses when you don't live in them. I mean, and so I can just picture Naomi and Ruth arriving back to her family's plot, and she's busy trying to get things there at the house taken care of. They desperately need food, and so basically Naomi's like, I'll take care of this, you go and do that. And not only that, but Naomi had explained to Ruth the way Israel worked as a nation how that God had given special instructions for how to take care of the poor. Let me just go off topic just for a little second. If you want to understand how society should function, re read the Pentateuch. Read God's instructions to Moses about how life should be. I mean... What kind of care do you provide the poor? You want a good model? Go and just read what God said Israel needed to do to take care of the poor. You turn over to Leviticus. When you cut your crops at harvest time, 
Don't cut all the way to the corners of your field. In other words, you've got to leave the corners. And you leave them for a reason. And if grain falls on the ground, you don't pick it up. In other words, if you've got a stalk of barley or wheat and you drop some of it, you can't pick it up. Or if grain falls off on the ground, you can't pick it up. You don't pick all the grapes in your vineyards, especially those that fall to the ground. You must leave those things for the poor people and the people traveling through your country. Watch Deuteronomy. At harvest time, you might forget to bring in all the crops from the fields. Do not go back to pick up all the grain. Oh, I left some sheaves over there. Don't go back. Once you've left the field, you don't go back. Do not go back to pick up all the grain. Leave it there for foreigners, widows, and children who have no family. If you do that, the Lord your God's going to bless you in all your work. When you knock the olives off your tree, look at this, y'all. Shake each branch only once. If olives don't fall, that belongs to the poor, the widows, the orphans, those who are traveling through. When you pick your grapes, you just pick through the vines once. Leave the grapes that remind for foreigners, widows, and children who have no family. And, and, and so one of the things you find right off the bat is that caring for the poor is not an option for the children of God. But I want you to notice how God set up the system. Do the poor need help? Absolutely. Do you just give it to them? No. You provide for a means for them to work for it themselves. You know, one of the things that we constantly battle in in our country is how do you help to the poor? Do you just hand it out to them or, or do they have to do something for it? God would say, listen, it's always better for everybody. If if you've got, you know, some effort into the system, into the process. And that's what we see here in the taking care of the poor. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And then, of course, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Caring for the poor, folks, is not an option for us. And let me just say a word about our church. I appreciate our church so much for what it does for the poor in this community. I mean, we make a difference. Whether it's those that need inexpensive housing with the Christian manners over here, those who are older in life, what a blessing that is to people over there. When I think the, the, the benevolence program that we have, and if you don't work in the office here, you just don't see how, how many calls come in every day and the care that we provide to our community every day. When I think about the free medical equipment, I mean, people who come over there and when, you know, how much does it cost? It doesn't cost anything. We're just giving it to you. And the tears that begin to flow when people who knew that they couldn't afford a wheelchair or a motorized chair all at once realize that they have one because of the generosity of you. It's what God has called us folks to do. And we just need to be people who are consistent in doing it. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Here you go again. You have a remark there. And so one of the things that you see right off the bat in this chapter is happenstance. She just happened to enter into the field of Boaz. Now, if you believe that, I've got some land in Mississippi I want to sell you. All right? I mean, look at the next verse. Just then, Boaz arrived. Isn't that amazing? I mean, she shows up, and then Boaz, right before lunch, he shows up. Happen, happen chance? There is no, no such thing as happen uh, a chance in the kingdom of God. God is involved in everything. And I love the way he greeted the harvesters. Yahweh be with you. Well, Yahweh bless you, sir, they responded. I mean, here was a relationship between the owner of the fields and the workers in the field that you just right off the bat, you're like, wow. I mean, what a relationship, all God-centered right off the bat. And I just think what a marvelous example that is. And so Boaz asked the overseer, interesting word, same basically concept in the Old Testament that we have for elders in the New Testament, who does that young woman belong to? And I know that that sounds as strange as can be today. 
But, but the point in the ancient world is that because of the ancient world's nature, women needed to belong to a family somewhere. Whether it's a woman staying in her father's household or with her husband or in this case with the mother-in-law. And, and so a very natural question, who is this young woman? Who does she belong to? And the overseer said she's the uh, Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Bethlehem was a little bit small village. Everybody knew what was going on. I, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, in a part of uh, the country where, yeah, I mean, all you had to do is make a phone call or two and you could find out about just about anything that was going on in the community. I mean, just people talked. And, and that was the case back then, especially here. And, and he said to Boaz... She said to us, please let us glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now except for a short rest in in the shelter. In other words, she got here when the sun was coming up and our workers were already out there working and she got in behind them where it was allowed for her to pick up what had been dropped and she had been working all morning. She took a little break to go and, and get out of the sun for just a little period of time. What a, what a compliment about her. And so Boaz goes up to Ruth, and you can imagine the nervousness of Ruth. She doesn't know who this is. And, and this man walks up and says, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Now, basically what you had is the men out here, they're cutting the barley. They're, they're, they're putting it, you know, for the women right behind them. They're tying it up. And then they're taking it to be threshed. And basically, he says, you work behind the women. You know, any grain that falls, any sheaves that are left, watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men, I love this. I've told the men, don't you lay a hand on her. And Boaz's word counted. And so he's making sure she understands that she's protected and then he goes on, and wherever you are, and whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars. Now you need to realize everybody knew she was from Moab. She's a foreigner. And yet, here is Boaz saying, You get thirsty, you go over there and you get a drink. By the way, you need to remember the way we used to drink water. How many of y'all grew up drinking out of a dipper? Wow. By the way, those hands keep getting fewer and fewer as the years go by. Yeah, when I was a kid, my grandmother didn't have running water. And there was a bucket on the front porch that came from the spring, and there was a dipper in it. And and if you understand dipper etiquette, which there was an etiquette, you take the dipper, you drink some water, you leave enough in the dipper to swirl it around, pitch it out, so that the next person doesn't have to drink after you. Okay? That's the way the system works. And, of course, any time you had an uncle who was dipped in, who went to get a drink, you didn't drink for a while, okay? <laughs> Whew! And, and, by the way, in some parts of Mississippi, an aunt who was dipping snuff, same thing. <laughs> some of the young people going, what? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, different world uh, today uh, than back then. And so... You go drink out of this and don't worry about people. And then I love what she does. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you've noticed me? A foreigner. Why? Why, Boaz, are you doing this? And I want you to look at the answer. Because it's the answer that's amazing. I've been told. Boaz heard the comments. He's heard the stories. I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. I have heard how you did not abandon Naomi. You didn't allow her to go. I mean, from Moab all the way back to Bethlehem was a long trek. I mean, a, a, a woman by herself walking that far, can you imagine? And, and of course you're like, yeah, but how much help would Ruth be in? At least she had a companion. And here's Boaz, and he says, I've heard the stories. 
I've heard what you've done. And that leads us to our next lesson, which is never underestimate simple acts of kindness. I cannot emphasize this enough. If you want to have an influence in the lives of people, then take note of opportunities to do something nice to them. You know, they got a death in the family, take them a dish. They've got somebody in the hospital, you know, send them a, 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 a card to help pay for gasoline. I mean, someone's going through a hard time, write them a note. They got a birthday, send them a birthday card. I mean, we all know the difference that it makes when you get one of those Nan Beatty cards in the mail, right? Man. Why, Miss Nan's just been such a blessing to me in June over the years because I don't know how many times I'm like, we got another car from Miss Nan. And I think Miss Nan's the only person I know of that if you send her a card, she sends you a thank you note for the card you sent her. Wow! Little acts of kindness can make all the difference in the world. Paul would put it this way, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Do something nice for all people, but especially those who belong to the family of believers. And let me tell you, people will remember. Boaz did. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded. Boy, you see the prophetic nature of his words May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel. And in that last phrase, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Why would he say that? Why would Boaz say that? Because that's exactly what his mother had done. It's what Rahab had done. Rahab had taken her refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. And Boaz could sense that that Ruth had done the exact same thing. And and hearing his mother tell about Salmon coming out, willing to marry a harlot of all people, and giving her a chance for new beginnings. You know that new beginnings was something that was on the heart of Boaz. And he wanted a new beginning for Ruth. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. I mean, you can imagine how nervous she was when Boaz walked up, and then all at once the difference. But let me tell you, the difference was just beginning. Humility is always honored by God. I mean, that is one of the things you're going to see all the way through as Ruth is just humble on top of humble. I mean, you turn to Proverbs, he will humiliate taken from the word humble, those who make fun of others, but he is kind to those who are humble. You only have one of two choices in life. Live a life of humility or live a life of humiliating others. It's our choices. And Ruth chose the path of humility. So lunch came. And when lunch came, it says at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. And you can just see Ruth. Ruth's sitting over here by herself. By the way, you ever eaten by yourself? I I tell people that eating by yourself is the worst thing you can do in the world. Most people don't know. When I went to Freed Hardeman, I didn't know a lot of people at Freed. I mean, I roomed with two guys I'd never met before. I, I didn't have close friends who went to school with me. And I found myself on multiple occasions eating by myself in the cafeteria there at Freed. And let me tell you, when you're sitting there eating and you're looking and you're seeing everybody else talk and laugh and tell stories and and, and tables crowded with people and you're all by yourself, there's nothing worse in the world. And I can just see Boaz seeing Ruth over here taking some of that barley she had picked up, starting to eat it, and he said, come over here. And she comes over and he says, have some bread. She didn't have bread with her. Have some bread. And by the way, you can dip it in the wine vinegar. I mean, you can dip it in something that's going to make it really taste good. And then when she sat down, he reached and he said, By the way, here's some roasted grain. And he gave her so much that she ate all she wanted. And then she pulled the Cracker Barrel number, right? You ever been at Cracker Barrel and it's time to leave and you look down and there's two biscuits and three pieces of cornbread left? You think Les Chapman's sending that back? Oh, no. 
I'm like, give me a napkin, June, we're wrapping this up, biscuits are going to be for in the morning, and that cornbread's going to be later tonight in a good glass of cold milk. Okay, usually I get a, oh no, oh no. All right, a lot of people don't like, don't even know what milk and cornbread is, but I grew up on milk and cornbread, and Cracker Barrel cornbread makes good milk and cornbread. She took it with her. And then I love what he then said to the men. Let her gather among the, among the sheaves. Don't, don't put her way back in the back. You let her gather among y'all. As y'all are cutting and wrapping the sheaves, she can gather there so that she has first dibs on everything. I mean, look at the kindness. And don't you reprimand her. I mean, you can almost imagine them going, would you please get back there? You're in our way. No, not Ruth. You don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks. In other words, as you're putting the bundles, you throw some down just for her. And then when she goes to pick them up, you don't rebuke her. I mean, when I saw this, I thought, wow. Because let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. One of the things we need to realize is words have incredible power. Can you imagine what would have happened if one of those workers had said, would you get out of here? We don't need Moabites up here working with us. Can you imagine what that would have done to Ruth? But Boaz made sure that that didn't happen. You turn over to Proverbs 18.21. This is out of the message. I really love this. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Our words make a difference. And let me say a word about that as far as being a part of this church family. You have the power to be, as John Micah said earlier, discouraging. Easy to sow words of discouragement. Or you have the power to be encouraging. And it's all up to you. And can I just tell you that a church that is an encouraging church is a much better church to be a part of than a discouraging church. I I tell you, you you go to work in a church and you've got people who are discouraging. I've shared this on many occasions, but in the first church I worked at, there was a former elder in the church. And he didn't like me. And I didn't know why he didn't like me. And he'd come up to me and he had a big, deep voice that scared the daylights out of me. I was in my 20s. He was, you know, on up in his 70s with this deep bass voice. And he'd say, Leslie, you're not going to like what I'm fixing to tell you. And he was always right. (laughs) And here's here's the sadness about that. He was the most discouraging person for eight years in my life. Even though I tried everything in the world to build a bridge to him. Every act of kindness I could do. June and I would bake cookies at Christmas time. We would do this, we would do that. And yet it never made a difference. You have a choice. Make the right one. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and then she freshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to an ephah. I mean, when was the last time you got an ephah barley, barley, right? I mean, I read that, and I'm like, okay, i got to get a translation that makes sense. Stan, N-E-T. N-E-T got it right. So she gathered grain in the field until evening. When she threshed what she had gathered, it came to about 30 pounds of barley. I mean, imagine, you don't, you don't have just five pounds of flour, You've got six of those five-pound bags of flour. I mean, she had gathered an enormous amount of barley. Why? Because God had inspired Boaz to arrange to take care of her. And she carried it back to town, and her mother lost how much she had gathered. And then she brought, brought out the Cracker Barrel stuff. Hey, got some roasted grain here. You want it? And, of course, Naomi's like, where did you glean today? Where did you work Blessed is the man, or be the man, who took notice of you. She knew someone had been kind. Because you don't gather 30 pounds of barley in one day. Not as a gleaner. Not as a poor person. I mean, this was enough for them to live on for days and days and days. And she's like, who in the world did you work with? And she told him, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. And all at once, the Lord bless him. He has not stopped, and the he here is God. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. To you and to me. 
I really think Naomi saw herself as being dead here. And for the first time in a long time, Naomi sees a glimpse, a glimpse or a glimmer of hope. That man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. He even said to me, Ruth said, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. And it's just not the barley grain. It's the wheat grain at all. And that's exactly what she said. Verse 23, so Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest was finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. Boy, underline that because that's fixing to change. Chapter 2 ends with hope. I love that word hope. I don't watch a lot of movies. And, and when I do watch movies, I, I get hung up on certain ones. And I'll go back to them over and over. I mean, yesterday McClintock was on, starring John Wayne. Love McClintock. But there are some movies that I don't like the movies, but I love the endings of them. Uh, one of them is Dead Poets Society starring uh, Robin Williams. If you've ever seen that movie, it's one of the most incredibly discouraging movies there is, except for the last five minutes. And you don't know how many times I've turned over and saw it on, so what time it went off, and I'd go back and just watch the last five minutes. But the last five minutes are fantastic, absolutely incredible. But my favorite, and and I've shared this in the past, is the movie Shawshank Redemption. Now, I've only seen the TV version of it. I mean, when it came out in the movies, it was rated R. We didn't go see it, but later when it came on TV, I saw it. But what I love about it is not the whole story of the movie. It's got heartache scattered throughout that movie. But it's the ending. The ending is is, is about Andy, played by Tim Robbins, and, and Red, his friend, played by Morgan Freeman. And they had been arguing about hope and the value of hope. And Andy had escaped from Shawshank. He'd gotten out, and he had left Red a message. If you ever get out, you go to this particular location, and there's something buried there for you. And Red goes there, and when he digs it up, it's a note found in a box. And the note begins with these words. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you and finds you well. And then he invites Red to come and work with him to get his project off the ground in Mexico. And the movie ends with Red on a trailways bus heading toward Mexico in hopes he can go and see his friend Andy. And here's the last lines of the movie. And it's my favorite ending to any movie that's out there. Here's Red on the trailways bus. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it's been in my dream. I hope. And that's the way it ends. I hope. I think that's what Naomi was saying at the end of chapter 2. I hope. And because of who her hope was in, that hope was going to be realized. And I think the same is true of us. God says... Put your hope in me and watch what happens. If today you've been pretty hopeless like Naomi and you need to put your hope in someone, God the Father and Jesus Christ His Son is exactly where it needs to be. And if we can help you put that hope there today, whether it's in faith and baptism or whether it's in prayer, we'd be honored to do it. You can let us know right now as we stand and sing.